right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, joining from you from a sunny San Diego. And today I am joined by Sue Barrett, who is in the lovely city of Melbourne, Australia. How are you doing, Sue? Well, thanks, John. And Sue is one of the most authoritative thought leaders talking about selling the selling profession in Australia and the world today, an advocate for human-centered ethical sales pra practice. And she's passionate about creating a fairer, more peaceful world in which we can all be prosperous. And that's something that uh, uh, we at Pipeliner CRM totally endorse because we see salespeople as peace wealth creators, peace producers, and, uh, uh, and, and so we're, we're very much in alignment. But what I wanted to talk to Sue about today is this wonderful book she wrote, 142 Days of Gratitude That Changed My Life Forever. So um, Sue, to start with, can you just give us a little bit of background on the genesis of this book? Yes, well, the book actually was created uh, last October. However, its genesis started in 2014. Um, it was precipitated by a rather unpleasant uh, experience in my life, where in April 2014, I had a person who had been in my business for a while actually take uh, a large contract away from us. And the market conditions were pretty tough. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm used to, you know, markets go through ups sure. and downs. And so I knew what we had to do. But there was something about this betrayal that really hit home to me. And I found myself really, you know, kicked in the guts. And at the same time, my dear father, who was 80 and had been unwell for the last couple of years with heart failure, um, had collapsed and then died within that two-week period. Mm. So as you could appreciate, I was dealing with two rather momentous, uh, you know, events in my life. And also it was one of those things where it really makes you face yourself to see how do you deal with these things. So I'm a very compartmentalized person. And when, you're under, when I'm under stress, at least anyway, I tend to kind of lock down and have to get on with what the tasks are at hand. Mm. And I had to deal with the fallout from my business. My team were amazing. We rallied together, but we didn't have much time to recoup $300,000 worth of lost revenue right. that would have made our year quite reasonable, but now I've made it really tough. Mm -hmm. So head down, backside up, out we went and uh, to drive business. And um, in the meantime, did my father's eulogy. In the meantime, you know, managed my family. And I have to say I was pretty run down and stressed. Mm -hmm. So... In the July of 2014, one of my dear friends, Mike Lowe, posted on Facebook a little gratitude exercise, which was going around the internet and said, practice, put right down three things a day you're grateful for, for five days, mm -hmm. except mine went for 142 days. <laughs> because I found the experience of dealing with such challenges, but taking just even a brief moment every day to reflect on whether there were big things or little things or even just a clean glass of water, mm -hmm. it really grounded me and made me feel like there were beautiful things in life still. There were things like my children, you know, my mm -hmm. sport, all, all that kind of stuff that when you are in a really stressful situation, you kind of forget. And it just brought me back to myself and to what the world actually is. So I did that for 142 days. And then for whatever reason, at 142 days, I just stopped because it just felt right. So I'm not saying that you must do that for 142 days. It was just right for me. Right, right. And then last October, I had this idea that I could write a book on gratitude. So I collected all of those things off Facebook. And then over three days, I put together what is really described as a part business book, part memoir, part self-help, underpinned by science and philosophy, which is kind of not, it doesn't fit any genre, yeah. but it's or, been very... Or if it's all genres. <laughs> well, exactly, which is kind of what people say about me anyway. And it just was something that I thought I could give as a gift out to people because I have found that, you know people often forget in the striving for success, particularly in sales, mm -hmm. we can often forget sometimes the little things and stuff that actually is important and keeps yeah. us grounded. Anyway, that's sort yeah. of the genesis of no, it. And that, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think one of the first things that uh, I'd like to ask you, so the idea of gratitude. So I totally agree with you, but we live in this crazy world today, right? Where, you know, thanks to, social media and all of these other things, it's managed to 
Um, we live in what I call like a comparison culture where, where people see snapshots of other people's lives and then they fill in all the gaps around it and they come up with, oh, Sue's got the greatest life in the world and my life sucks in comparison because we just tend to compare ourselves negatively to things. So the idea of turning it on, your, on its head and actually focusing on being grateful for things, like you said, even a, a clean glass of water when there's many people in the world who don't have clean water. I mean, that's a very powerful thing, but it really kind of flies against the popular culture that we're in today, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does, actually. And this is where the more prosperous we become, the more detached we become from what actually gives us that grounding. And there's some very interesting work by a, a, a professor called Dr. Frank Moll uh, in Australia, in Queensland. And he's actually written this book called The Wealth Paradox. And what he's actually found is the wealthier people get in general, mm -hmm. the meaner they become. And what I found in when I was looking at the moral case for gratitude in my book is that I found that from other research as well, that when people become disconnected from the day to day, uh, when we real, when we don't remember what we had to do, like in the, you know, in olden times, we, we worked on the land, we mm. were really connected and we knew that if we didn't plant this today, we wouldn't have food tomorrow, so on and so forth. Whereas a lot of us in at least the developed world, we can get access to all sorts of things, you know, at the click of a fingers, really. And we sometimes don't realize that, but for the kindness of strangers, we can actually have this food on our table, that we can exist. And when we get disconnected from people and we get wrapped up in materialism, and we think that we then have to show off and show to people, or prove that I as an individual are somehow important, we basically um, diminish ourselves. Mm. Because as humans, we are community creatures. We rely on each other. We need each other to actually survive and flourish, not just materially, as well as emotionally and relationally. And I think that this is what we've forgotten. And people like to parade their fanciness, their finery, um, their frippery. And at the end of the day, who are you really? And can I work with you? Can I trust you? And can we actually just do something really nice together? Mm. That's what I think is missing. And I, and I think you've, you've touched on something that I, I feel very strongly about. And, and that is, again, is it seems that a lot, a lot of people today want to sit around and, and as I said, there's a, there's a comparison culture, but there's also a discontentment culture. And, the, and unfortunately, there's an anger culture today where people mm. have just gotten so angry about everything. But you know, sit around and like pontificate on big global issues and, and all of that. When to your point, I always believe that if you can be the, the best person you can be, if you can be the best partner to your partner, if you can be the best parent to your child, the, the best neighbor in your community, the impact of that is infinitely more than sitting around in your backyard pontificating about big global political issues and spouting off and getting angry. There's, no, there's, there's nothing good comes out of that, to be honest, where so much comes out of if you narrow your focus down to things that you can impact. Yeah, you're absolutely right. One of my colleagues yesterday mentioned a concept called recreational anger, where people... <laughs> I love that. It's great, isn't it? Where people sit back and they tweet and whatever and their indignation at the state of the world. Whole, you know. Whereas I've always approached the world from what can I do now? Mm -hmm. And where is my agency? Because when people don't have agency, when they don't feel they can do something, this is where you get this existential crisis mm -hmm. as well as the environmental crisis and everything else we've got. I mean, I've been carrying, I have a science background. I, I don't just, you know, sit here and point fingers. I mean, I, I do study things. I look at the environment. I look at what I can do as a parent, as a business person, you know, as, as a person in the community. And I've been carrying, as an example, cloth shopping bags for 35 years. Mm. I've been, we've had solar energy on our house, you know, for 15 years. We've had solar energy on our business since 2014. Now, does that make me a saint? No, it just means what can I do now? What can I, within my remit, to make a difference? And it's one of the reasons why we started the Selling Better movement as well, because Selling Better is about mutual prosperity. It's about, you know, working together to actually not just flog more 
or consume more. It's thinking cleverly. It, it's actually an adaptive strategy. A lot of people make the mistake of um, saying um, Darwin's quote is the survival of the fittest. Actually, mm -hmm. no, it's not. It's the survival of the most adaptive. Right. And, I, and we've also started the Finding Common Ground for the Common Good initiative because we all share, like clean water, we all share that as humans and as creatures, you know, beyond humans. We need clean water to survive. That's mm -hmm. part of our common good. And to me, the skills of, of great salespeople that ability to be otherish and, and, and connect and understand other people, to, to find out what they're thinking, what they're feeling, to, to find common ground together that we can work on and move forward with. To me, so great, selling is a life skill. Yeah. And it actually is one of those practical things you can hone and craft. And the more you work with people, the more empathy you can develop. The more empathy you have, the more you can be grateful for these interconnectivity of what we have as, as humans and as you know, creatures of this earth. And I'm sounding terribly, you know, sort of, but it is, yeah. it's, it, it, it comes back to, at the end of the day, we work with each other. And if we can work towards the common good, then we actually can do great things and make change at a local level and stuff these governments out there mm. or you know whatever let's work locally as and, and and have agency together as community and to be honest and and i and i and i agree with you and i think sales is a sales is a great example because um when you're involved in a in a sales situation as you say if you're doing it if you're doing it properly and, and smartly you should be looking for common ground so think about it in a sales situation i'm not going to probe you for your politics immediately so that we can have a drag down knockout fight and argument over right i'm going to and that's something that if we extended that to our lives in general would be a good thing saying looks look for common things where we can just relate as human beings and not looking for differences where we can just have an argument all the time mm. and, and get angry. Um, but I, but I, agree, I agree totally with you. And I think that's why s um, selling to some degree is falling, is falling victim to a lot of these other influences when people are forgetting that, you know, it should be a good experience. It should be a, a, a mutually beneficial experience. It should be a win-win situation. It shouldn't, it shouldn't take on any other, you know, negative um, forms um, that it sometimes does. And, and if done properly, like we said, it's it generates prosperity on both sides exactly in fact if i come back to my dear yeah. father i mentioned at the beginning of our conversation not long before he died two things happened um i knew when I, he had always asked me what i do is eulogy so about a year before his death i could see he was not going well so i decided mm -hmm. to write a, a it was it ended up being six pages of font 10 bullet points of all the things that i could remember we did together mm -hmm. why i was grateful for him you know all this sort of stuff which of course he was really grateful for. and then i turned it into his eulogy right. which was actually interestingly enough a letter of gratitude to him mm -hmm. which i read out to the you know to the um to the community that attended his funeral so I had actually discovered before I started the gratitude diary in the July that I'd actually been writing letters of gratitude all my life so I always think it's important to let people know you know what they mean to you before it's too late and actually build these bridges and, and, and common ground and those sorts of things as well and I think that you know when we when we engage with each other and we start to to put aside our differences and find what we do share together, then great things happen. Mm -hmm. Great opportunities emerge out of that. And I think if we can stop this kind of just sell more for, so I can, you know, make heaps of money and actually focus on individuals and how we connect with each other and, and, and find that that would actually be incredibly helpful. I'm trying to remember, actually, I forgot what the other thing I was going to say. It's probably come back to me. Sorry about that. Yeah. But um, just think that uh, where we're at um, in these sort of days is don't get disassociated from the day to day. Mm -hmm. Come and back I, and ground yourself. Yeah. And I think perspective is a huge thing. And I think we've lost a lot of perspective. Um, I heard an interesting statistic not too long ago where in the US, uh, if you earn more than, if you earn $30,000 or more, which in the year $30,000 is not 
a big salary, right? No. But, but if you earn thirty thousand dollars or more, that puts you in the one percent category in the world, or five percent, some top five percent earners in the world. So you can have two perspectives. You can say, "Oh, look, I have nothing. I'm I earn, you know, I don't earn that much, and blah blah blah. Life is terrible." Or you can go, "I'm actually be grateful and say, look, and I'm in a fantastic position. You know, glow. If I look at things in terms of the greater world, and I can, and I have the opportunity to grow from here." And well, it's just about perspective. Well, that's right. But also it's relative to, and I remember the second point I'll share in just a moment, mm -hmm. it is relative to, and I think that the sad statistic is that the way the, and look, we can get into sort of economic mm -hmm. and, you know, arguments and things like that and just, and an argument isn't necessarily something we disagree with. It's actually a well-founded case. I don't like opinions. Yes, and, and, to be, and to be honest, um, we live in a world where opinion is passed as fact nowadays. I know, and I'm, I'm not in for that, because as a scientist, if I'm going to put an argument forward, it better be underpinned by fact. All right, so that's how I operate anyway. So just, just to put definitions aside, an opinion is something that anyone could make up, but, if, but an argument is a well-founded case that you put forward. Anyway, um, I think the thing is that, I don't know if you're aware, but in uh, 1980, the low income, lowest income annual wage for people in the US was sixteen thousand dollars mm -hmm. per annum. Okay, do you know what it is today? No, I don't. Exactly the same. Mm -hmm. There's not been a shift. There's something not quite right there, and so we've got to look at it relatively speaking. I agree. Thirty thousand dollars in India would be like a, a you know, a, 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 a huge amount of money, but it's all relative and, and what happens. So I think these are some of the challenges and big issues. The second thing I forgot to mention that I forgot earlier on was that my father, before he died, a few months before, found a book. Now he ran a business of 120 mm -hmm. people. He was the lead uh, sort of call it sales manager, if you like. It's actually where I learned how to sell well with him because he was very client centric and, and worked with people in that collaborative way. And he gave me a book circa 1960, and it was called How to Hire and Manage Your Sales Men. So it was a little bit sexist in the title. But when I actually looked inside it, the values and the principles of working together and res mutual respect for each other and the duty of care leaders had to help their people be prosperous and to help them be prosperous with customers hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of got off track a bit, I think, where people have got caught up in this wealth creation, you know, money making orientation, and they've forgotten that actually without others, you can't exist. You right. can't actually do good things together. And if you want a long term relationship with people and do good work together, you don't want to go screwing them over either. Mm -hmm. So you need to kind of work with each other and do it for the betterment of the whole. Anyway, we could go on forever well, about these things, I'm no, sure. No, no, I think it's 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 great. So they, they, coming back to the gratitude thing, um, and by the way, the the other point I, I meant to make on on the thirty thousand before we lose it is the is is exactly what you're talking about. The, the perspective is that if you're at if you're in that category, uh, you can rail against people in the top one percent of your country, right? Yeah. But you're also in the top percent of somebody else's category. So yeah. we can all find, and that's what I'm saying is like, sometimes you need to say, okay, instead of rating against this, I need to find a way of improving my own circumstances because, because yeah. everybody is in somebody else's category. Well, you're absolutely right. This is to me, this is why life is all about opportunity. Yeah. You know, the opportunity to do good work, the opportunity to develop yourself. Now, it does help to have community around you that provides yes. support, education, and you know, environment that actually is encouraging of you, not diminishing of you. So again, I come back to community, that mm -hmm. no one survives in this world or thrives on their own. And when I see people going, oh, self-made billionaire, millionaire, that's crap. <laughs> they haven't got there by themselves. They've got there because of the collaboration and support of other people. Mm -hmm. And I just think we forget this and we put these false idols up there and we worship at their altar for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. And so just coming back to the gratitude thing. So what is it that if you, if you really, so when you're 140 days, so every day you started looking at things, you, you know, and listing things to be grateful what did that do psychologically to you? How did that make a difference to your day? So people who are watching or listening, because I'm, I'm always concerned about how 
all of us can sometimes allow us ourselves not to start our days in the best way, right? You know, we can we can look at the news and because the news is designed to make us angry and it doesn't matter where you sit on the political mm -hmm. spectrum. That's what your news is designed to do. It provoke, it's supposed to be provocative. So you get annoyed, not a great way to start the day. Or maybe, as I said, you're on social media and you get envious of other people. So what is it psychologically that gratitude exercise does for you on a daily basis? Okay, well, there's not just for me, but I actually then I've got a chapter in the book called The Science of Gratitude. So there actually is um, hard science that's now showing that practicing this does change us psychologically and physiologically and neurologically. So there are shifts and changes. The reason why I wrote this book is that whilst you're in it, you don't, you can't necessarily see it or sure. feel it. But when you look back over time, you can actually see there's a shift and change. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I noticed about myself and then what I've been able to find through other bodies of research is that by practicing gratitude and actually focusing your mind and brain in that space, it does actually open up other pathways. It actually creates other space for you to look at things and gives you perspective. It helps you understand things. And it actually precipitated for me an incredible bounty of creativity. Because when I started to look at what was possible, when I looked at what was beautiful, and when I looked at what was just simple, and then all of a sudden my brain was focusing on things that actually I can do. I can move forward. I can look at this. I can look at that. So I found my can do. I'm always a can do person, but I really became incredibly creative and can do from doing this. There was a very interesting experiment done at one of the American universities. I think there was about 300 people in this experiment who were all seeking counseling. They were students mainly seeking counseling for anxiety and depression. And they split them into three even groups. And they got group one, to, they all continued counselling. So group one also had to then write each week a letter of gratitude. They didn't have to send it to anyone. Mm -hmm. It could be about something or to something. So they, they did that. The second group was asked to reflect on the things that had made them unhappy and were worrying them. And then the third group just had counselling. So no other task. And it was amazing, the changes in anxiety and depression, the reduction in that from the people writing letters of gratitude. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have medication where it's appropriate or whatever, but the fundamental shift in people's perspectives and demeanour and openness to opportunity and awareness was incredibly shifted through asking and writing about or seeking out aspects of gratitude. So I found for me, it gave me a much more stable base to operate on whenever I found myself feeling a bit angsty because do I have I stopped practicing gratitude? Absolutely not. In fact, I find myself doing it every day, but more in a random way rather than a formalized written thing. And when I need to, I write stuff down if I feel myself feeling a bit low or flat because it doesn't make me just instantly happy because that's a whole other furphy out there as well because life isn't, a, you're happy in moments, but to me, life is more about contentment which yeah. is a more a easier way to operate yeah mm -hmm. i go up and down and feel crappy one day and happier the next whatever but am i contented with where i'm heading and what i'm doing and i became less materialistic as well mm -hmm. anyway uh, and i think no i think that's a, an interesting point because i was going to mention discontent because i mean i think discontent is is a state that a lot of us operate in a lot of the time right and we we may all you know use it to drive ourselves forward or whatever but i think to your point i think taking a step back and being grateful and being content with the things that you have today or the relationships you have or whatever it is that uh, that you want to focus on i think as you say that gives you a much more stable basis and and i think it becomes uh, and i think the other thing is this isn't complex stuff right i mean it's it, pretty simple and, and straightforward but extremely powerful and i think sometimes we overcomplicate the world oh without a doubt now look human beings are complex creatures mm -hmm. but i found that this simple task of taking a couple of minutes each day just to be grateful for three things um write it down because that's actually quite um determinative as well when you mm -hmm. actually write it or type it down it didn't cost anything and it became this practice that it didn't take up very much space, 
I didn't have to go to some self-help guru for it. It actually just centered me and it was very inexpensive, <laughs> you know, but it had so many wonderful benefits. I mean, as I said, it precipitated so much creativity. That horrible experience I had in the April 2009, mm -hmm. uh, 2014, bit like an Australian bushfire that kind of wiped yeah. us clean, if you like, mm -hmm. but out of it came all of this beautiful growth and we flourished and, and we really, and, but we, we never take things for granted. Mm -hmm. We always remember where our, where our feet had planted, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And that's why I always say, you know, sometimes when you look back over your career or your life and, you know, maybe you're talking with your significant other or whatever, and you know, there's a temptation to say, Oh, you remember when we, I took that particular job and went there. You'd say, oh, yeah, that was what a bad mistake that was. Blah, blah. And then I would stop myself and I say, no, it was not a bad mistake because that path led to these other things. And sometimes your path doesn't lead to a destination. Sometimes it just leads to another path that leads to a destination. And so you have to look back that everything fits together in, in some ways. And you have to be as hard as it is. I mean, you looking back now, you're probably grateful for those experiences as much as as painful as they were well exactly so um it's one of those things where i i went through this you know baptism of fire mm -hmm. really to to handle this and i actually came out of it because one of the things i did um even before i started the gratitude diary itself later that year i actually wrote down a list of all the things i was good at mm -hmm because my confidence had been really, because I'd been, right. but I went, stuff this, I'm very evidence-based. What can I do? What am I good at? How do I help people? What can I actually achieve? And just get, you know, and like get up there and get your ass out there and, and get going because you can't sit still. Life is about moving forward. It's about mm -hmm. progress. And it's not a straight line. It's a wiggly line. And sometimes it gets all knotty and then you wiggle out of it again and wherever you go. But you've got to keep progressing forward. And there are dark days. Mm -hmm. I admit that. We all have dark days. And this whole superficial, everyone looks like they've got it together is the biggest load of crap. Can I tell you how many women <laughs> I've had actually write to me to say, oh, my God, Sue, I've had similar experiences. I mean, basically, it's white-collar crime, what's mm -hmm. happened you know, sure. to me. Mm -hmm. um, they have had similar experiences and how they've had to survive and get through that. And some don't, but some do. But I've had a number of women. On the surface, they just look like they've got it all together. But underneath, they have been burnt bare by yeah. life's experiences yet somehow came through it so this is very interesting isn't it no one's got it together no, no nobody one. has and that's why i find that, that the comparison culture that we live in is so insidious in so many ways because yeah. people are constantly comparing themselves to people and 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 as i said making all these assumptions having no idea what's really going on behind the scenes <laughs> we used to have this joke actually in ireland when i was growing up is that they're, you know, you'd always have a house or two on your street that they seemed to be richer than everyone. Like they had the latest car. And if you went into their front room, it was beautifully decorated. And it used to be the joke of saying, yeah, but have you ever noticed you've never been allowed to go upstairs? <laughs> because there was no furniture up there. And everything was piled into the front room to create yeah. an impression. So, I mean, the joke, the, the, the whole point of that was you never know. Oh, and that's right. And that's why I think when you actually just meet people as people mm -hmm. and free of judgment, if you can, it's very difficult. Sure. But I, I know like, and that's where this sort of detachment comes in. You know, when I coach people or I work with them or we work in organizations, they're struggling and dealing with stuff. You have to create this safe space, which is why back to those skills of good sales, really good questioning skills, active yeah. listening, mm -hmm. being able to reflect and actually hold silence. Uh, you, you've almost started me on another of my uh, <laughs> and another of my soapboxes because um, and I don't want to run too far over time although yeah. I could go on for hours um, is that idea yes is that people fear silence and especially in a sales situation people fear silence salespeople do and they shouldn't because if I ask you a really good searching question and you stop for a moment and are quiet i have to give you the space to think about it if i in, if i invade that space with with my words i have actually stopped you processing and thinking through this and maybe i've just cost myself a sale well, i think 
the world at the moment in that kind of recreational outrage we were talking <laughs> about before has really been talking at each other, yes. not with each other. And this is where finding common ground is actually a key, a, 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 the main key to our future prosperity as humans. Yeah. And, as, and I think that, you know, everybody lives by selling something. Everyone's got an idea, initiative. They want, to, they want to make contribution. How they engage other people and find that common ground to then ignite more opportunity, work together constructively, that to me is the path to future prosperity and, and a better outcome for all. But when we're talking at each other and trying to outcompete each other and outdo each other, the world won't move forward. And I think these are the things, I mean, many other things I've learned, but I'm so grateful for the journeys that I've been through and the way I've been looking at and studying what is ethical human-centered sales practice, what is good business practice, what is honorable business practice, and just what is about being a decent human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. And that's a great one. I'm very grateful for you uh, spending some time with us today. Again, Sue Barrett. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, popular in Iran, CRM. But before we go, Sue, I'd just like you to uh, tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more. Thank you, John. Um, I run a business called Barrett. You can find us at Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T dot com dot A-U. We're all about helping people and businesses sell better. We have a sales philosophy called Selling Better, which you can find at sellingbetter.com. Uh, we also have a sales strategy and operations framework where we can audit all of that. So we do a lot of business consulting in that space, as well as also a lot of education in relation to um, both uh, in-field, in-classroom and online. And we also have online education at salesessentials.com. So I, hopefully that helps people find me in some way. Please search me out on LinkedIn, Sue Barrett, you'll find me there. And um, um, I am really enjoy this conversation. It's so yeah. nice to be able to talk about these things. Uh, yeah. And hopefully it's of use to the people that uh, you, we are uh, talking with and uh, sharing this information with. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and hopefully you'll come back for another conversation because there's lots more we could think about. And, and I would just uh, encourage people when you pour that glass of water tomorrow for yourself or that bottle of water you buy or whatever, is feel a little gratitude. Because if you want to put things in perspective, that's something that, should, that you should get outraged about is the fact that there is still today people in the world that don't have access to clean water. So there you go. Be grateful for the glass in front of you. All right, listen, thanks, Sue. And uh, I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.